Let not your hearts be troubled. We in God believe also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and will take you to myself, that where I am, you may be also. And you know the way to where I am going. Hey, thanks again for inviting us into your home or your office or wherever you're watching this. So glad to connect you. We're in a series. We're going to wrap it up on the church. I hope that as we have looked at what Jesus said, he is building. He has created in you a, a, a renewed love for, appreciation for. Man, this is Thanksgiving time, right? Grateful for the church. I hope that there's been a sense of awe even in you as you look at this supernatural organism that Jesus is building. And we go, oh my. And it pulls us into, into this wonderful thing uh, that Jesus is doing. So we talked about the essence of the church. We talked about the diversity of the church, the unity of the church. We talked about the mission of the church. And today we're going to look at the future of the church. And so, you know, Josh, I, I realize maybe you do, when we get up every morning, you get up in the morning, um, to start every new day, you have to have something uh, to look forward to. I mean, even if it's small as, I'm going to get a cup of coffee, or I'm going to get you out of bed, right? Or maybe I'm going to wear a new outfit today, or, or maybe, hey, I'm going to get to see my friend. But we got to have something to look forward to when you get up in the morning, right? Or if you're watching this on Sunday, my football team this afternoon, or That's something right. like that, That's right? right? So, But we do this all the time with, uh, if you're a student, you're just thinking, I just can't wait till that test is over. Or I'm looking forward to the break coming up, or for school being done, and I'm looking forward to being with my friends this weekend, or whatever it might be. We have all sorts of things like that where we're really uh, looking forward to what's to come. And we do this on a larger scale as well. It's not just on a day-to-day -day basis. We're also talking about, okay, Think of your life. You think, I just can't wait till I graduate. But then, once you graduate, it's, I can't wait till I get married. Uh, then it's, can't wait till I have kids. And then it's, can't wait till the kids are out of diapers. And then it's, you, you, right, you just keep going on and on until, can't wait till they graduate. And then it moves to, I can't wait till they come back home. And so, it's on a larger scale as well. We're always looking toward what's to come to give us hope to sustain us there in the midst of the day to day. That's right. It, it, it's, we all have to answer this question, you know, it, it moves us, boy, life will be great when, and so we kind of move into our day that, that way, so we need something to look forward to, otherwise, think about this, life becomes crushing, it folds in on us, we don't have any hope, we're full of despair, if you really believe that your best life is in the past, if you're always looking back to the good old days, then the future is, is very bleak, right? But if you really believe that your best life is in the future, that what you have ahead of you is what's going to be the best that you'll experience, then everything changes. Your future is bright and you're full of hope. And so as we come into looking at the church and the church's people, right, it's us. What do we as the church have to look forward to. What we're going to see today is that when it comes to the future of the church, we can say with absolute certainty that our best life is ahead of us. So, so Josh, as the church, how can we be so sure, so certain that as we think about the future, our best life is ahead of us. How can we be so sure about that? Yeah, well, you know, if there's one thing we've learned this year, is that that phrase, Lord willing, is not just something you <laughs> throw right. onto the end of a sentence to make it That's sound right. more holy. That's right. It's the truth, it's right? It's the truth. So, that's what the Bible says, that the heart of man plans his way, but the Lord establishes his steps. You know, we have all sorts of plans, all sorts of hopes that we're looking forward to, but those things may or may not come to pass. The Lord, though... What he plans, that always comes to pass. And so we want to look at, okay, what is his plan? What's his purpose? And 
really, for this age, God's plan is the church, right? Mm-hmm. And so um, what we see is that uh, we have our hope of being certain. We have a hope of being certain. Now, when we often define hope, it's like a wishful thinking. But when the Bible talks about hope, it's a confident trust. It's a confident trust in who God is, what he has done, and what he will do in the future. And so why can we have this confidence? Well, I invite you to turn to Matthew chapter 16. Matthew chapter 16. Here Jesus is kind of traveling with his disciples, and he asks them a very important question. He says, who do people say that I am? And so they answer, and they give him um, some thoughts that other people have about him. And Jesus turns the question in on them. He says, who do you say that I am? It's a question all of us have to ask. Who do you say that Jesus is? Peter answers, you are the Christ, the Son of God. That's the correct answer. Peter gets it right. And so Jesus, in affirming Peter, says this, I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Now, there's a lot we could unpack with that verse, and so we're not going to have time to do all of that here today. But uh, basically what's going on is the way I understand this is Jesus is telling Peter that, Peter, on your confession of me as the Christ, I'm going to build my church, and nothing, nothing is going to stand against that. Not even the gates of hell, not even death itself can stop this. And so what we see here is, is three very important things. Is Number one, we see that... Christ is the one who is doing the building. He says, I will build my church. Well, because of who Christ is then, number two, Christ's work is certain. He says, I will build my church. And since his work is certain, then it logically follows that three, Christ's work cannot be stopped. He says, I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. See, the church is God's plan for this age. And we get caught up in thinking all these other things may stop it. We think a pandemic or a political election or these kind of things will stop the church. But that's not the case. Jesus says not even death itself can do that. And the reason why, the reason why we can have confidence in this is because of who Christ is. He does not change. He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Uh, We read this in Malachi 3. God says this, I, the Lord, do not change. And we're told in Hebrews 13, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and today and forever. God doesn't change. You know, the way Spurgeon put it in one of his sermons, he said, God does not change in his essence, in his attributes, in his plans, in his promises, in his threatenings, and in the objects of his love. Our God does not change. And hear me, this can be either the most glorious news you'll ever hear or the most horrible news you'll ever hear. Because if you do not believe in Christ, then be warned. Our God does not change, and neither will he change on that last day of judgment, when our only hope is to stand in the righteousness of Christ and not our own. But if you do believe in Jesus, then be encouraged. Because our God does not change, and he will not change on the day of judgment, when our only hope is to stand in the righteousness of Jesus and not our own. He does not change. And so this means he will not stop loving you. If you belong to him, he will never let you go. He did not die just to make our salvation possible, but to make it certain. He died to bring his people to himself. And those people are his forever. He will not change his mind. He will not let them go. He will not, his love will not grow cold. He will hold us fast. For our Savior loves us so, he will hold us fast. He will never decide to let go. You know, the Gettys have a song, O oh, Church Arise. And part of it goes like this. When faced with trials on every side, we know the outcome is secure. And Christ will have the prize for which he died, an inheritance of nations. See, Christ will have the prize for which he died. He is building his church, and nothing can stop that. Not even death. There's been a lot that's changed here over the last year. (laughs) Probably not a surprise to you listening uh, online. This is a change, right? There's been a lot that has changed. I, I remember, I, I just recently, this, this week, saw a picture from 2016. And it was, a, it was a big crowd of people and three people standing together there. And my first, my first response was, oh, why aren't they wearing masks? 
That was 2016, right? There, it, it's just crazy how, how much has changed here in the last several months. And um, I, in prepping this, I Googled you know, church and change and all that, and there's a lot of articles that came up from this year about ways the church is changing, will change, and must change in order to survive. Now, as a pastor, I recognize the prudence of a lot of these conversations. But hear me, church. The things that are changing are not nearly as significant as the things that remain the same forever. Our God does not change. He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And that means that our mission as a church does not change. Mm. We're still called to love God, to love others, and proclaim the gospel. Mm. That doesn't change, and nothing can stop that. Not Mm. even death can stop the mission that Christ has for his church. So our God does not change, and our mission does not change, and our future then does not change. It is secure with Christ. So we're all looking for constancy somewhere and something. We're all turning to something, but it's often the wrong thing. Because God is the only one who is not unchanging, who is not changing. But also then that means our future with him is secure. Because God doesn't change, he will bring us home. And because God does not change, it gives me hope that I can. That one day I will be holy and perfect and blameless in his sight, with him forever. And, and you know, when we're, when we're in sin, we often say something like, well, I just can't change that. That's just who I am. Or, or um, I, I, I'm too sinful. I, I, I can never change and, and come to Christ. I love the way Jen Wilkin puts this. She says this, Whether uttered in hopelessness or defiance, this statement that I can't change is a lie. Only one person doesn't change, and that's God. But when faced with the need to turn from sin, I answer the question of who is unchanging with I. Because our God does not change, our future is totally secure. And because our God does not change, it gives me hope that I can. Wow. You know, Jen Wilkin touches on something that's really important for us, and it leads us to the second thing we want to talk about, our future. And that's the idea that our future, guaranteed for certain, is of us being perfect. We have the hope of being perfect. Perfect. The hope of someday we will be sinless. We will be blameless. And uh, it, it, that's very, very uh, precious to us. It gives us great hope in the messes we deal with. Really, like the day's going to come when I'm not going to mess up anymore. That's right. So I want you to turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 1. And uh, Paul brings us out. Now, as you're turning there, 1 Corinthians chapter 1. The church in Corinth was a mess. I mean, if there was a church that could get into sin or get into a fight or lose sight of its mission or lose sight of its identity, the Corinthian church did it and was in it. But Paul was certain about the Corinthian church's future and that they were all going to be sinless someday. You go, you're kidding. No, watch this. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, I'll start in verse 2. Paul starts out by describing their identity, who they were. To the church of God, born of God, born again, church of God, that is in Corinth, to those sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be saints, together with all those who in every place call upon the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, both their Lord and ours. Grace to you. Peace from God our Father, the Lord Jesus Christ. I give thanks to my God always for you because of the grace of God that was given you in Christ Jesus, that in all speech, all knowledge, even as the testimony about Christ was confirmed in you, so you are not lacking in any gift. So Paul starts out by saying, let's remember who we are. Our identity is in Christ. You are called saints, fully equipped and gifted, but we're people who still sin. And read Corinthians. They were sinning bad. But Paul said, don't lose sight of the hope of your future. Watch what he says. Verse 7, you're not lacking any gift. As you wait for the revealing of our Lord Jesus Christ, who will sustain you to the end, 
guiltless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. God is faithful by whom you were called into the fellowship of the Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. What Paul was pointing the church in Corinth to as messed up and as sinful as they struggle with all kinds of stuff. Paul says, look, don't lose sight of the hope of your future. You're going to be perfect someday, sinless. Because see, here's the deal. At our death, or if Jesus returns, we will be transformed. We will be given glorified bodies. We will be like him. No more sin. Imagine that. No more temptation. No more evil desires. No more failure. No more. We will be in an eternal state of perfection. And you know what? You really like me there. <laughs> like we'll really, I mean, imagine life like that and being in that kind of place. And the, here's the deal. Because of our identity, our destiny is a certainty. God says, God says, I am faithful. I will get you home whole, totally sinless and perfect. This whole idea comes up again in Ephesians chapter 5. Now in Ephesians chapter 5, we always think about, you know, Paul's talking about husbands and wife and marriage, right? Husbands love your wives and, and, and that whole deal. But really what Paul's pressing into here is, that our marriage here on earth is a reflection of the relationship Jesus has with his church, his bride. Listen to the future. Listen to what Paul says in Ephesians chapter 5. Verse 25 and 26, he says, Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, listen, so that he might present the church to himself in splendor, without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that she might be holy and without blemish. This is a beautiful picture of the church and the future when we as the bride of Christ get presented to Jesus and we are this beautiful, spotless bride. Think of, think of weddings and, and the bride comes down the aisle, right? And this is us. This is how God views us and this is how he sees our future. I love the cornerstone of our church. I'm glad that this verse, here's a picture, there's the cornerstone of the church here at Grace. And you notice that the verse that's listed on the cornerstone of Grace Church is Jude 24 and 25. It talks about the future. It talks about our future. Here's what it says. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you blameless, before the presence of his glory with great joy. To the only God, our Savior, through Jesus Christ, our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all time, now and forever. Amen. Church, if you're a believer in Jesus Christ, this is astounding. Do you see how God sees our future as believers? I've done all kinds of weddings. I don't know how many a couple hundred weddings anyway and there's it's always I've heard a lot of grooms say this I believe that my bride is a gift from God would you hear what these passages are saying that we the church are a gift from God to Jesus Christ and someday he is going to present us to Christ imagine this this moves me. There's a guy named uh, Scotty Smith who says it, it this way. You know, the groom uh, says his, his bride is a gift from God, and he says this, Well, Jesus treasures and cherishes us as a bridegroom treasures his bride. Should anyone ask the question, Who gives these sinners to the Savior? The father responds enthusiastically, I do. 
Because, see, he presents us beautiful and holy and blameless and spotless and says to Jesus, here is your bride. That's us, people. That's us, church. And that's our future. This beautiful consummation. And Jesus embraces his perfect, beautiful, sinless bride. That's our hope. Which leads us to the final thing is we also have a hope of not only being perfect, but being together. You know, you think about the bride and groom thing and, and uh, pictures of, of a groom carrying his bride with her wedding dress over the threshold. Well, over the threshold of what? It's over the threshold of their home where they're going to live. They're finally married, so they're going to live together and do life together and move in together and be together. And Jesus says, that's our hope with him and his church, his bride. Being together, you know, is a very, very deep longing of the human soul. Jesus, in John chapter 14, he sits down with his disciples. This is shortly before he's crucified. And he says these words to them in John chapter 14. Let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it weren't so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and take you to myself, that where I am, you may be also. The disciples' hearts were troubled. Do you know why? Because Jesus had just told them that he wasn't going to be around much longer. You're going to seek me, and I'm going to be gone, and you can't go where I am. And and the disciples couldn't imagine life without Jesus. They couldn't imagine life without him. You have a loved one, maybe, that that's the way you feel. I can't imagine life without Jesus. And the disciples are like, I can't imagine life without you. And Jesus says, don't be troubled. The day's coming when we will be together. Listen to what he says. Listen to what he says. He says to them, if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and I will take you to myself. That where I am, you may be also. Church, this is our hope of being together. Listen, it's not the mansion we look forward to, right? It's not the streets of gold. It's who I'm with. It's not the it's not the place that's prepared for me. It's who is preparing a place for me and wants to be with me in it. That's that's what we long for. The church's hope for the future is to be home. And we look forward to being together with Jesus. This is heaven. This is heaven. Amen. And you know, just a few chapters later, you you read from John 14 and John 17. We looked at this just a few weeks ago. Jesus prays, uh, Father, I desire that they also, whom you have given me, may be with me where I am. That's the prayer Jesus has. Father, I pray that my people here, my church, would be with me. Mm. And that's the prayer of our hearts, is Jesus, I want to be with you. And that's our future. Mm -hmm. That's what's going to happen. And we get a picture of that. The very end of the Bible, Revelation chapter 21, we get a picture of what this looks like. And we get a picture of our future together as a church with our Savior. We read this. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city... New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them and they will be his people. And God himself will be with them as their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be any mourning, nor crying, nor pain anymore. For the former things have passed away. And he who was seated on the throne said, Behold, I am making all things new. And he said, Write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. He said to me, It is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, 
the beginning and the end. To the thirsty I will give from the spring of the water of life without payment. The one who conquers will have this heritage. I will be his God, and he will be my son. Mm. That is our future. That is our hope. It's the hope of being together. And you know, right there is actually the culmination of the whole biblical storyline. The whole Bible is about us being together with God. See, he created us to be with him and to know him. And yet, Adam and Eve in their sin rebelled against him and, and, and said, we can do it our own way. And, and every single one of us since have said the exact same thing. Said, I can do it better on my own. <laughs> Don't trust you, God. But God didn't give up. See, in uh, Genesis 17, God tells Abraham, I will be God to you and to your offspring after you. Exodus 6, God tells Moses, I will take you to be my people, and I will be your God. Leviticus 26, God says, I will walk among you, and will be your God, and you shall be my people. The prophets pick up on this all the time, Jeremiah and Ezekiel especially, with, with the, the language of, I will be your God, and you will be my people. Do you want a sentence that sums up the covenants God makes with his people? There you go. I will be your God, and you will be my people. So look at Matthew then, Matthew chapter 1. You know, we're celebrating Christmas here coming up. Yep. What does it say? Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel. And then Matthew tells us, which means God with us. So, see, um, God desires to have his people with him. That's the aim he's been taking throughout the whole storyline of Scripture. But before we could be with God where he is, he had to first come to us where we are. Because we, in our sin, could not stand in his presence. We deserve death. But Christ takes on human flesh, dwells among us, and dies for us so that we can be with God. That's our hope. That's our future. See, we are all created for relationship, and most fundamentally for a relationship with God. And so I think uh, John Piper asked a very perceptive and important question when he asked this. The critical question for our generation and for every generation is this. If you can have heaven with no sickness, with all the friends you ever had on earth, and all the food you ever liked, and all the leisure activities you ever enjoyed, and all the natural beauties you ever saw, all the physical pleasures you ever tasted, and no human conflict or any natural disasters, could you be satisfied with heaven if Christ were not there? Mm. That really brings it to a head, doesn't it? The deepest longings of our heart are to be with God, to know and be known and to love and to be loved. And, and that is our future. As the church, that is our future. You know, the holiday gatherings uh, are a challenge, aren't they? I mean, we realize that this year especially, that um, you can have... The, the, the table set, you can buy the turkey, you can have the tree set up, but the biggest challenge is getting the family to come together, to be together. And this is what we really long for, right? Is to be together. You know the song, I'll be home for Christmas, you know, and the chorus kind of goes, well, only in my dreams. Well, it's going to be only in our dreams for a lot of people this year, and it's hard. Some people, they've experienced the death of family members. And so we, there's something deeply fundamental, deep and fundamental in us. Of relationally, we got to be uh, together. For believers, I want you to listen to the hope we have of being together. Paul wanted you to know this. 1 Thessalonians 4 we do not want you to be uninformed, brothers, about those who are asleep or other believers who have died, that you may not grieve as others who have no hope. For since we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so, through Jesus, God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep or died. For this we declare to you by a word from the Lord. This is the certainty we have. The changeless God, we declare to you by, the, by a word from the Lord, that we who are alive, who are left until the coming of the Lord, will not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a cry of command, with the voice of an archangel, with the sound of the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive, who are left, 
will be caught up, listen, will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will always be with the Lord. Therefore, encourage one another with these words. This is our future. Listen, uh, the church has so much to look forward to. I mean, we, we, we have the hope of being perfect, blameless, pure, presented to Christ in spotless glory. And he's going to do it with joy. That's what we have coming as the bride of Christ. We, we have the hope and can look forward to being together, finally together, never again uh, to be separated in the relational satisfaction that is stunning. And all this is a certainty because Jesus said, I will build my church. He said, I will have the prize for which I died. Look, church, we have so much to look forward to. Our destiny is astounding. We want to we want to wrap this up um, today by engaging in three songs. We're going to sing three songs. Now, don't turn this off. Don't get a cup of coffee. Don't check out. All right. I really want you to engage in these worship songs. And Josh and I are going to come back when the song's over with a real important comment. And, and wrap up with this, all right? So I want to start with a, a hymn that the church has been singing for 500 years about its future and the certainty of its future and its glorious future. So you worship together as we sing, A mighty fortress is our God, and his kingdom will reign forever and ever. Amen. You worship together with this.